We developed a really good algorithm last time called the Newton-Raphson algorithm, and it has every promise of being very fast and very accurate. Now, looking at it from a graphical point of view, we could see those convergence lines moving in pretty quick as our points got closer to the solution. But we'd like to be a little more quantitative in this section and come up with some theory behind why the convergence is so fast. We'll also look at some examples on, on finding the square roots again, as we did at the beginning of the quarter, and look at just how good a job it does relative to its competing methods, the bisection method, as well as the false position and modified false position methods. Let's turn then back to our old friend, the Taylor series. Yes, it comes up a lot and we're not done with it. There will be other subjects that we'll need the Taylor series for also before the end of the quarter. But as we look at the Taylor series as expanded to a linear term, we realize that this formula here looks a lot like what we used for the tangent line when we set up the Newton-Raphson algorithm geometrically. The one big advantage we end up getting is an error term associated with the Taylor series. And the Taylor series error will be the second derivative of the function evaluated at some point zeta, which is trapped between x and the point about which we're doing the expansion, so x0. Note that that is squared, that we're going we're to have a heyday with that pretty soon. Let's now take the predictive portion of our Taylor expansion and drop the error term. If we look at this expression, which should remind us of what we did with the tangent line, the approach we took then was to set the function value equal to zero. After all, we're looking for a root. And we'll approximate that root with the linear portion of the Taylor expansion. We need to give a name for the value of x for which this line is equal to zero. So let's call that x1. We want to set the line equal to zero and then solve it for x1. When we do that, if you do the algebra, x1 is exactly the same as our Newton-Raphson algorithm. So it's not a big surprise that we end up with the same thing. We're really doing a very similar operation. But the big advantage we've got is we have an error term, which we didn't get when we look at this thing geometrically. If my x0 was close to the root, x1 should be even closer. And the error associated with x1 should be proportional to the difference between x1 and x0, which we think ought to be kind of close. If this difference is less than 1, the squared of that is going to be even smaller. Now, if we do the same thing we did last time, we want to take x1 and have it play the role that x0 was playing before, and we'll end up getting an x2. That should be even closer yet, and the error will be proportional to x2 minus x1. That squared will be really a small number, and our error is quite low. If our error is quite low, then if I plug x2 back into my formula again and crank out an x3, since the error was low to begin with, x3 ought to be really, really close to x2. Well, if x3 and x2 are almost the same, their squared difference is going to be tiny, and my error is going to be very, very low indeed. What did we call this kind of relationship before? Now, if you remember, we would use the power of the polynomial associated with the error and call it the order of convergence. So we would say that the Newton-Raphson algorithm is an order of two convergence algorithm. If we had done the same thing with our bisection method, we would have found it's an order of one convergence. So we have every reason to think that the Newton-Raphson algorithm will screen past the bisection method in which it will, and we'll see here in a moment. We are now able to write the formula in an iterative fashion, just like we did before. We'll just write this thing as x sub n plus 1 equals the Newton-Raphson formula using x sub n. The error term I am going to denote just a little bit differently. Uh, previously, we said a2 meant it was second order error term, and e3 meant it was a third order error term. I'm going to take a little liberty with this term and associate the n with the iteration number. 
The reason we're doing that is because the order of convergence on the Newton-Raphson is order of two. That's, that's just what it's going to be. So I'd like to use this index to keep track of how many iterations that I've actually done. It's now useful to take a look at each piece of the error term. What could be going on with the second derivative? The first thing to note is if, in fact, this algorithm is, in, is converging, then not only do we get benefit of the square of a very small number, we get the benefit that this zeta is contained within this collapsing interval. So zeta basically gets stuck. If zeta is getting stuck, the second derivative of zeta is going to get stuck too, unless we're really unlucky and we're near a singularity. That means we could approximate the second derivative as some constant. So this is another motivation of why we call this an order of two convergence. K is unknown, but we don't care as long as it's bounded. It's still this term that's going to drive the error. Well, that all looks really good, but how about in practice? How does it really work? Well, let's take a look at an example uh, going back to our first week of class when we wanted to find out what the square root of 5 was, or maybe more generally, what is the square root of an arbitrary constant we, call, we will call A. So what we need to do to develop an algorithm that can accomplish the square root is find some function whose root is the square root of A. Well, this sure looks to me like it's going to do it, because if I plug plus or minus the square root of A into X, then x squared will be a, and a minus a is 0. And it's pretty clear that the root of f is plus or minus the square root of a. Well, then I'm all set up for my newton raphson algorithm. Here's my formula that I wanted to use. I plug xn into the function and stick it in the numerator. I differentiate it and then stick xn in the derivative and put it in the denominator. Well, what is the derivative? The derivative would be 2x minus 0, or just 2x. So if I plug in x sub n, the derivative of f evaluated at x sub n is 2 times x sub n. So let's write that down. So x sub n plus 1 must be x sub n minus this expression here. Unfortunately, this is a dangerous equation. Now to remember why, we have to go back to uh, chapter 1. And in chapter 1, we were nervous about differences unless these two numbers were quite different from each other. But if these two numbers are close, then we are going to start losing significant digits when we perform the subtraction. Well, will they be close or not? You bet they will, because my x sub n is getting very close. And if I square the square root of a, I get something very close to a. So by definition, by construction, this difference is every time going to become the difference of two similar numbers. Was well, there anything you could, you could do to fix that? Well, if we use the example on page 60 of your book as a motivator, we could form a common denominator between these two terms and see if we couldn't do something about the, the differences. If I multiply top and bottom by 2x sub n, I've accomplished putting them into a common denominator. But now I can subtract x sub n squared from 2x sub n squared, and that will leave 1x sub n squared. And a minus times a minus will produce a plus. And that means the result will involve a ratio, but there are no subtractions anywhere and only a single addition, which looks pretty safe. Our next step, then, would be to turn this formula into pseudocode, which is not going to be very much work. We do need to initialize some things. We need to define how much error we're willing to tolerate. It'd be nice to start a counter variable to zero. And, of course, we have to pick an initial guess. Fortunately, we only need one, unlike the bisection algorithm. Set up your loop. It's nice to save the previous value, which initially is just x0. And you only have one workhorse formula in the whole thing, and that's your Newton-Raphson algorithm. After you compute your next x value, which we're calling x sub n plus 1, we can easily take a relative error uh, by comparing it with the previous value, and we do our check to see if we're ready to terminate. This n here is a safety net. If case I do something wrong in my algorithm, I won't have to run more than 100 times before it stops and I can check out what's wrong. 
So let's do this in Excel. And I'm going to borrow from the previous Excel file we had when we were looking for roots for a quadratic. And we'll apply it to this quadratic that finds square roots. So everything up to this absolute error column is you're familiar with, except I think we used relative error before. And the last two columns are all we need to do the newton raphson algorithm. If we make a really bad guess on what the square root of 5 is, on the bisection method, we will set it to the high value, and the low value will be 0. Clearly, this is a very conservative range within which your solution must lie. Furthermore, on the newton raphson algorithm, we'll apply the same bad guess over here of 5, and just see how they do. Well, this is the key column to see how the bisection method's working. And you see as it is converging, 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 until we end up getting uh, better than 10 to the minus fourth, assuming that was our requirement. Now, in the previous slide, we said 10 to the minus fifth. We're going to lighten up a little bit and say we just really want 10 to the minus fourth. So we achieved that here on line 17. OK, not too bad. We, we got to our tolerance using the, using the bisection method in 17 runs. Let's take a look at newton raphson Again, it's a bad start. Uh, F now being our measure of error is 20. That's pretty bad. Uh, but it converges down to 3 pretty quick with a lot less error. And by the time we get to the second run, we have an error of only 0.4. Now, look what happens to those exponents. As you're getting close to the solution, you start doubling the number of significant digits you're getting every single run. And by the time you get down to the sixth run, you have reached the precision of double precision reels, uh, and there's no reason to go any farther than that. Uh, you just screamed by the bisection rule. And uh, down here, I'm claiming it's four times faster. That's with an error of 10 to the minus fourth. But if you really wanted to use all of the bits that you have available in double precision, you can accomplish that by just a few more runs in the uh, newton raphson algorithm, where you're going to be at it for a very long time in the bisection method. So this certainly is promising uh, that it works very well. But what can go wrong? What, what if I picked a bad starting value to begin with? Well, here's our same data again, maybe a little bit bigger. It can easy, you can see it easier. Again, we're starting with 5 for a newton raphson algorithm, and it converges nice and quickly like we just saw previously. But what if 5 is replaced with something really, really bad, like 1,000? Uh, what if I started with my initial guess of the square root of 5, as being a thousand. Well, it's dumb, but let's say I did it anyway. Well, look at what happens to our error. Uh, the function itself should be coming to zero, and we are converging the x values. We're getting much sl um, smaller quickly, and again, we get within region of rapid convergence, and the same thing happens. We just run off the end of our machine error, and we're pretty happy. That's nice. That means if I pick a really bad guess on the high side, I still converge quickly and accurately. Well, what if I picked a really low value? Let's suppose I picked 0.01 uh, for the square root of 5. What it does, it shoots over, it gets too big, and then just comes back on the same journey it did last time. Either way, pick a really small value, pick a really large value, and you're going to get there to the right answer anyway. So what we would say is it's robust against bad guesses. And that's nice. That means you're going to have stable results, a stable algorithm, regardless of how badly your user abuses your program. Very important feature. We're going to wrap it up there on that happy note. It looks like the newton raphson algorithm works fast. It works accurately. You can use it to create stable algorithms. Uh, boy, what else could you want? Is there anything that could go wrong with newton raphson well, yes. As it turns out, there are a couple of things that can get you into trouble with it, and we will look at that in 3.2c. We'll also notice that it's pretty easy to detect when you're going to have trouble and anticipate it, so even then the Newton-Raphson algorithm does well. So we'll pick that up in section 3.2c.